lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Who, for some reason, likes Templeton Rye. Man, that's like the best whiskey. <laughs> it really is. Like, No, it's it's so far from the best whiskey. I, I don't even know <laughs> where to begin. I Like, whiskey should not taste like cotton candy. Actually, I guess, <laughs> so Templeton itself doesn't taste like cotton candy, but if you ever make a Manhattan with it, it tastes like cotton candy. Yeah. Well, and the Templeton first, is way too sweet anyway. Well, it's super like, sweet, like, but I like that. Like, uh, I like the sweet flavor. Mm. Like, I like rice. Like, I'm, anybody Well, I like rice, me. too, but the thing to like about rice is, like, the kind of spicy aspect yeah. of rice, like. That's that's all good and all, but I'm I like the sweet man. Like I like something with a sweet flavor to it. And Templeton's is like the sweetest. <laughs> like it, it it yes so. yes. I think um, that you should probably stick to the girly end of the liquor. You think so? Counter. Is that yeah. where that where I need That's to be? Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is exactly. that where I belong? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. You you need the um, the oh, like I flavored like... rums and stuff <laughs> oh, like that. Yeah. That's where you're at. Oh, I don't know about all that. I do <laughs> like whiskey. <laughs> But yeah, I I like it to be sweet though. Like I like it to have the that sweet note to it. Well, maybe we should just order old fashions all the time. That, like, I like a good old fashioned. See, yeah. and I, I don't. Um, and I know that I should because you know I'm like this whiskey purist or whatever. Yeah. But, um, I don't understand adding sugar to whiskey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like to me, it's sweet enough. Nah. It, it starts off sweet. You don't need to add more sweet. Yeah. And and the. The thing about, and that's all that a old fashioned really does to whiskey is just make it even sweeter. Yeah. Um, to me, I mean, like, I'm sure that other people have different opinions about that. I really like cocktails, but what I like about cocktails is that it creates something completely different. Yeah. Like that you you put all these ingredients together, and I say all these ingredients. Like my favorite cocktails have like two like, ingredients. Yeah. Um, and they're both like <laughs> liquor, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but you know, like two or three ingredients and, uh, maybe you even like all three ingredients separate. I generally do. Yeah. But you put them together and it doesn't taste anything like any one of those things that you put into it. It becomes its own. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like, uh, you know, one of these, um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts things. That's what yeah. I like about cocktails is the, the way these, um, flavors interact, creates something completely new and different and better than all of it together. Yeah. But I, yeah, and the old fashioned just doesn't do that for me. Yeah, yeah. It just enhances the already delicious flavor. And uh, <laughs> Templeton Rye, I just think it's terrible. Oh, man, I love that stuff, <laughs> I, just, I just think it's terrible. It's definitely my go-to. And the reason that we're talking about this, by the way, is that um, we just uh, cracked a bottle of Elijah Craig's small batch. Yeah. Oh, I shouldn't have mentioned it on, the name on the podcast. We just... No, we, we just always, crack something new. No, no, I mean, we sometimes do, but I don't, I don't know. know. I've been We're trying to talk avoid about doing it. that. Yeah. We're going to talk about it. We All might right. as well talk about it. Fine. <laughs> um, opened a bottle of Elijah Craig Small Batch, yeah. uh, which neither of us had ever had before, which is actually kind of strange because I, I think it's, it's a pretty, pretty popular. ubiquitous. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you had it, I was like, oh, I've seen that all over the place, but yeah. I've never had it. <laughs> yeah. Me either. It's like a $30 bottle here, which isn't bad. Yeah. And, uh, and it isn't bad. Um, I like it. It's a little sweet for my taste. Yeah. But not. It's not. It's not Templeton Rye past the line. I was sweet. thinking to say it's not that sweet no. <laughs> to me. Uh, but it, but it is good. Like it has a good flavor to it. Mm -hmm. I like the way it's on the tongue. I like. Um, I like it. Feels it feels thick. Yeah. Like oily. Yeah. Um, it's it lingers a little, yeah. and I and I appreciate that. Like the linger. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that flavor to linger a little. Yeah. Um, I, that's kind of the point too. Like, you know, like, and I've had whiskeys where, um, you drink it and you're like, oh man, that's really good, but then the flavor's gone too fast. Yeah, yeah. Like it doesn't have any kind of finish. It don't just, have no hang time. Yeah, it just, it just, it's over. Like you swallow and that's the end of it. Yeah. And that just makes you want to drink more. Well, yeah, <laughs> and that may be the purpose. Who knows? Maybe yeah. this was a calculated. Right. Anyway. Um, I, I like, uh, I like a, a longer finish on the whiskeys. I like, yeah. I like it to kind of like stick. Hang around. Yeah. A yeah. I can't, I can't, I keep thinking, I can't say any of this without it sounding like really oddly sexual and I'm, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. all of it sounds bad. 
I, like these clips are going to get taken out somewhere. And I'm gonna be like, oh, geez. <laughs> anyway, you got to hear it in context. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need to listen to the whole episode. <laughs> yeah, right. You should listen to the whole episode because we have no idea what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, yeah, that's kind of like open mic night or something. Like, yeah, just kind of <laughs> whatever kind of comes in the pops into our head. Um, uh, Mike's looking at a blank slate of notes. <laughs> yeah, I have not a single note taken. I I've been uh, I've been fairly busy, um, and I haven't felt like doing research when I got home. Yeah, because I've just been kind of wiped out. I mean, but we had time to get together and do a podcast. I yeah. just didn't have the energy to prepare anything. <laughs> Well, um, and truth be told, as far as like the news is concerned, like I like I mentioned to you earlier, there's some things in the news, but mm-hmm. nothing that I really felt like we needed to dive in and like delve into. Like yeah. it wasn't anything that I was like, oh, well, we've got like a, a serious opinion on this. I mean, it's all like, well, Trump got subpoenaed. Well, yeah, yeah. who cares? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that kind of thing. Well, good, because I didn't have time. <laughs> yeah. Um, or energy. I guess I had time. I just didn't have the energy when I had the time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's like this weird Heisenberg thing. Um, anyway, I, I so something that I did see um, in a in about an eight minute clip on Sky News, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, was um, I saw AOC get yelled at, which is endlessly entertaining to me. But um, this seemed uh, really significant and interesting because she was doing a town hall, I suppose, back in her district. Yeah. And um, she had a guy start like you know really um, yelling at her and uh, calling her a coward and so forth for not standing up to the Ukraine um, weapons sales or money redistribution, you know. Yeah. Uh, and he was saying, you know, we we elected you to be a progressive to stand against the the machine or the blob or whatever you want to call it. And I don't remember exactly what he called it. I almost pulled the clip, but the sound was really bad. It would have just been annoying. But so I'll I'll try and recap as best I can. And specifically like his exact words aren't really as important as As what he was getting at the message he was, he was trying to convey. Um, and, uh, and she kept trying to just like move past it and he wouldn't let it go. He's just like, you know, we, we want an answer to this, like explain why you're not stopping this uh, and that you are part of the problem here that's inching us closer to nuclear war. And, um, you know, there's you've had opportunities to stand up against these bills, to vote no on these um, on these. Uh, what, what do they call them? I don't remember. Anyway, these disbursements, yeah, whatever they are. Packages. Or yeah. Whatever. Yeah. And uh, and you haven't done it. And we thought that you would, and that's why we elected you, is because we didn't want you to become a part. Of, we thought you were an outsider. Yeah. Like, and we expected you to be an outsider and stand up to the the mainstream Democrat Party and whoever else. And you're not doing it. <laughs> and and Tulsi's doing it. Like, yeah. why aren't you being like Tulsi? Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's yeah. my favorite part because. Um, I mean, Tulsi's been in the news this week, obviously, too, mm-hmm. um, stepping out of the stepping away from the Democrat Party, right? And um, and I think that's that's. I mean, I, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Um, well, I think that the, probably that event instigated at least that part of the discussion. I mean, yeah. although I think you know the guy's like legitimately, he probably would anti-war. have been there either way. Yeah. But that definitely mm-hmm. is a factor in this, at least. Yeah. On some level. So so they you know the, they got him away from the microphone. Uh, yeah. somehow and um, gave the microphone to somebody else. And the other guy was like, no, I think you need to answer his question. Right? Nice. Like, this is an important issue. Like, why aren't you addressing this? And they, you know, and she ended up, first off, she did the normal, you know, victimization stuff uh, where, you know, they're being unfair to other people that are there to answer questions or to ask questions. And, yeah. you know, you're being rude to everybody else in the room and you need to let because other I'm people Because I'm clearly do this. not going to answer this question. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then suggested that she would come back and answer the question later, which she never did. Of course not. Um, but uh, I, I like, I really like seeing that. Um, I like, because there's been too little since Obama, was elected there's been too little of the left standing up against the war state yeah and that should be their thing yeah it, it 
I mean, at least in recent history, that was their thing. Like through yeah. through you know the last half well, of I mean, the 20th century. Through Bush, like yeah. Oh well, they were certainly, and I mean, you're starting talking about starting with Vietnam at least. Oh yeah, yeah. So anti-Vietnam, anti-Korea. Um, yeah. the left has been. But Bush was kind of the end of it. Like after Bush, Obama came in, and the left really kind of abandoned those principles since then. Yeah. And honestly, you you're kind of seeing the party flip thing here because Trump picked up some of those principles. Yeah. Now he didn't well, it, govern actually, with them, but it, like strangely, like historically speaking, it's a flip back. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. the The Republican Party had been historically uh, non interventionist because they were concerned with with domestic politics. Yeah. Or, or you okay. know, just like concerned with with what's going on at home. Yeah. Um, and not trying to reach out and control the world in in every way. Yeah. Uh, you know, the idea was small government, non intervention. Like so small far. government, kind of as we would mean, like as yeah. far as including the war state. <laughs> Well, no. I mean, historically, it, they were non-interventionist and yeah. small government, and, and actually meaning small. small oh, you mean, I, I understand yeah. what you're saying. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. No, I, I like flipped that in my head somehow. <laughs> yeah. um, and then uh, it it kind of flipped in the middle of the 20th century okay. um, into being more of a Democrat, a Democrat push to uh, prevent the war state. And part of it was just the Red Scare stuff. Yeah. Uh, after World War II. That the Republicans were so against the you know the communist movement and yeah but but yeah we're we're seeing a flip back to more of those conservative principles um, that the Republican Party started with yeah really just with Trump I guess that's not it's not really wide ranging I don't yeah. think but I mean Bush ran on that but then nine eleven happened and he completely abandoned all of that yeah so yeah that didn't take long and then. Yeah. Of course, the uh, the left had a hard time continuing to criticize the war state after Obama, their you know their savior, got in office and started like six more wars. Yeah, right. <laughs> so they they gave up on that pretty quickly too. It, it's nice to see them moving back in that direction. And we talked about Biden last week saying, and this was just in some uh, like uh, fundraiser. It wasn't like he was talking to the press or anything like that when he invoked Armageddon, when he said, this is the closest we've been to uh, Armageddon since the Cuban Missile Crisis and so forth. Yeah. He's just talking to a bunch of money people. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I remember think, when I heard about this, so I heard from somebody else before I, I found the clip myself of him yeah. saying it. Yeah. But when I heard from somebody else, I thought, well... Then back off, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not willing to go to nuclear war over Ukraine. No. I feel bad for the Ukrainian people. It, it sucks oh, for them. Absolutely. Like, absolutely sucks for them. But I'm not willing to give up the entire Northern Hemisphere just to help the Ukrainians. No, or even risk it. Well, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah. I mean, that's that's the worry is, like, the more we we engage in this whole situation, the the more likely it is to come to that, mm -hmm. you know? And the longer it goes on. Of course, there's always a non-zero chance, which is why we should get rid of the weapons altogether. Well, yeah. But um, but he did, you know, he kind of, he waffled a little, yeah. as he's known to do, uh, and came back this week and he said, well, we don't think that Putin would actually start a nuclear war. Uh, we, you know, he's a, he's a rational actor and, and we don't think that he would risk the destruction of, you know, modern civilized society over whatever's going on in Ukraine. And we, we think that he's a rational actor and, and will act rationally in this state. And I thought, well, I'm glad that Biden thinks that of Putin. I wish I thought that of Biden. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly my thoughts, because honestly, I'm more worried about our end than theirs. <laughs> yeah. And the, the concern, of course, is always... Well, you know, this one man is going to make this decision. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, this one man, Putin, this one man, Biden. But it doesn't make the situation any better to, you know, devolve that authority out to more and more people. That yeah. doesn't help the situation either. <laughs> All right. So I don't know what the what the answer is other than to get rid of these weapons. Yeah. 
And I'll reiterate what I said on the last podcast, which is that Putin never said explicitly that they were ready to use nuclear weapons. Yeah. He said that we will use uh, what everything that's available to us to defend our sovereignty. Yeah. Which they inc- which he includes is these new territories he's just took. Well, yes. <laughs> um, but they... This isn't a first... Res- you know, it's not the... Um, nuclear weapons is not the only option they have. Well, yeah. Uh, Russia has a very modern military with very advanced weaponry. They have conventional weapons that they can use. So I, I don't... I agree. I don't think that this is a, a very likely scenario, but the more that you push, the more likely it becomes. And to me, I don't even understand the logic of... I mean, I, I, I get the... Uh, I understand the argument that you can't let anybody with nuclear weapons just push around and do whatever they want. Yeah. But a whole lot of outs have been given by Russia for this whole situation. Like, this could have been avoided fairly easily with very little loss and essentially no loss at all for the United States. Yeah. And the truth is that the Ukraine would have given up any claims on the, at at the beginning of this, Yeah, they could have given up any claims on becoming, um, a member of NATO on, uh, total authority over the Donbass regions and, um, Crimea which they're giving up something, but the truth is that was the status quo anyway. Yeah. They wouldn't actually have been giving up anything. They would have just formalized it all. (laughs) Right. And save themselves some headaches in the future, probably too. Yeah. Instead, this is the situation that we're in. And when they came close to a deal, the West intervened and said, no, don't make a deal. We'll support you as long as we have to. We're ready to fight till the last Ukrainian. Yes. (laughs) So. And that may happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think it's been pretty clear since the bridge bombing, um, the assassination of uh, what's her name, Dugina in um, in Russia, the that Russia has said, okay, like you want to play this game, we can play this game. Like we we've got bigger toys to play with. Yeah. And uh, they and I thought it was particularly funny that we've been hearing for months. I don't know if you've been tracking this or it. I assume that this comes out in mainstream um, uh, broadcast media. This idea that oh oh well we're wearing the Russians down. They're running out of missiles. They gotta they gotta <laughs> buy missiles from Iran now and all yeah, this I've stuff. Heard, I've heard all of that. And yeah. then after this bridge bombing. There was a huge barrage of missiles that came out of Russia oh, yeah. into Ukraine. They all seem to have a shortage. Yeah. I mean, there was more today. Like, just this morning mm-hmm. when I was um, getting ready to come into work, they were talking about overnight there were more bombings and more bombings in yeah. Ukraine. And he, I, I think that they're setting up a situation here, it seems to me, and this is in no way justifying these acts, but um, it's... It's early still in terms of uh, cold weather yeah. in Ukraine, and he's knocking out electric plants. Yeah, he, he's knocking out their electricity all over. Yeah, I mean, um, he could. There could be some serious like implications here. Yeah, and, and one of the implications that I th- the the message that's trying to be sent, I think, here is you need to negotiate now while we can stop this thing, and you still have time to repair and get yourselves ready for winter. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because if the war continues into winter... It's going to get cold. It's going to get cold. Yeah. And, you know, kind of the same thing's going on with the whole energy thing, which obviously has been far more damaging to uh, the West and the EU than it has to Russia. Yeah. And uh, there was this this issue with Biden going over to Saudi Arabia to beg for lower oil prices. And they were like, no, we have our own state interests to deal with. Yeah. You know, we're looking forward to a global recession. We think demand will be down. Prices will be suppressed. We can't meet our budgets with lower prices in oil. So, yeah, we're going to restrict production so that we can keep these prices up. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. Yeah. You, Which, you, you made this bed, so. Yeah. There was a lot of talk about that in the mainstream media this week, too, with, mm-hmm. with um, the Saudis and that. Kind of, that the, and the, the, the whole thing was, you know, we've done so... Kind of interesting storyline here. So the 
the portrayal in the media was, well, we've done so much for the Saudis and for them to turn their back on us like this is just despicable and we can't believe they do this. But what is the things that we've been doing for the Saudis? The Yemen war? Exactly. That was exactly what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Is like that's I mean, that's what they're referring to is the mm -hmm. genocide in Yemen right now. Yeah. That that we've done we've done that for them and then they're gonna come back to us by just raising gas prices on, on us. I mean, mm -hmm. it's I don't know. I mean, it's all just it's all so depressing. <laughs> like Well, if we weren't so focused on the green agenda, yeah. We could make more hydrocarbons here. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it can be done. All you got to yeah. do is stop restrictions in some areas, open the Keystone pipeline. Yeah. Uh, there's there's solutions alternatives. to this type of problem and the same thing in Europe. Like they but they're so committed to this green agenda that, and it just it I don't know. I just really feel like these two are both intertwined. The green agenda and the the pushing away of Russia mm -hmm. just seem like there's th those two things are like bound together. Well, and it makes you wonder if, so these seem to be the two alternatives. Either one, um, the, the people intent on this shift to green energy yeah. were either unaware that this, that currently we don't have the capability to provide energy for all the things that we need without oil and natural gas. Yeah. Or yeah. they were aware of that and they don't care how many people it kills off to try and get there. And uh, the, and they're going to force this situation and that, to create, a, a, an, I guess, a, um, such an urgency to create green energy because of a lack of the uh, non-renewables. Well, I just think that they can't, they know they can't push this agenda with Russia putting out cheap energy. Well, and think of two of our other big targets for sanctions. Yeah. Um, Iran and Venezuela. Yeah. Like if all of you just, just, and that, we're antagonizing just, Saudi Arabia too. So, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and just think of a world where all of those nations were able to sell their products freely. Mm -hmm. uh, there, how would you ever? bring in the the green energy stuff with that on the market they i think i think that the green energy people just see that there's not without alienating these nations there's no way to get us to the green energy that they think we need to get to well and i think that they're wrong about that uh i i it won't happen as fast as they want well no but it would eventually happen i think if if those are viable sources of energy and i think that they are yeah. You just need the technology to develop further. Yeah. You need the technology to develop further. You need it to become more efficient so that it becomes less expensive. Yeah. But, but all of those things take time and we're just not there. Right. I mean, that's, that's where I, that's how I see it at mm -hmm. least. And at the same time, a lot of these European nations that shut down their nuclear plants too. Yeah. Which is actually a very clean energy source. So I, I watched a, a snippet yesterday. I think it was yesterday or one day this week on the news where there was a guy talking about just that. But he was arguing the other side that because the commentator was like, well, nuclear is a pretty clean energy. And he disagreed. He was some environmentalist. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, nuclear is not clean. It is not acceptable. We need to get away from these energies and blah, 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 blah. And I, I thought the same thing. I was like, I mean, it's got to be cleaner than the alternative, right? Yeah, it's cleaner than coal and um uh, And that's basically what petroleum. the commentator told him. He was like, well, it's cleaner than coal, right? And the guy c would concede that. He was like, well, yeah, obviously more than coal, but mm -hmm. still. And I was like, I don't know, man. Like, to me, you want to move in the right direction, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I understand the concern because, about nuclear, too. Well, because we the, at the end of the day, the important thing is we got to have energy. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that that's... Like, like you were saying, millions of people will die. Like, I mean, it's, we've yeah. got to have these things. So what are, we got, you have to look at realistically, what are the options? And the truth is, is the green stuff just isn't ready yet. Yeah. Um, but the agenda is so important that they're willing to sacrifice people because they won't be losing oh, yeah. anything. Like the, the people making these decisions won't be losing anything. Absolutely. Oh. So, um, and there's your problem with socialism. 
Was that the socialism part? <laughs> I guess no. I mean, I think we're transitioning to a socialism All right. thing. <laughs> How about that? Uh, so I did, you know, I was um, texting with a friend, and he's he's on the left, um, Marxist, and so forth. And I I get that. I used to be one. I, I'm I'm a recovered Marxist. Yeah, I understand. Uh, I understand the appeal of these ideas. Uh, and what I came to realize somewhere along the way was that there's no way that it can work on a large scale. And the reason is because um, you need you need a real shift in human nature and you're not going to get it. On a small scale where everybody knows everybody else, there's, <laughs> um, there's social um, pressure yeah. to conform. Yeah. Um, that you're all kind of interdependent, and so you, you need to do your part. On a large scale, too many people are anonymous and can work against the system in the background, yeah. in the shadows, and just take advantage. Yeah. Right. But um, one of the things that he said to me as we were you know, discussing the market issue is that, and I was saying, you know, the, the beauty of the market is that you have a whole like every single individual working towards their own ends. And this system came together that helps coordinate all those individual desires into meeting most of the needs of almost everybody. Like you may not get exactly what you want or everything that you want, but without knowing people at the other end that you're exchanging with, you're getting things that you need. They're getting things that they need. And it, it's just a, it, 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 the beauty of the system is that it allows um, people with different desires and different needs and and without knowing each other, strangers to each other, to work together. Yeah. To cooperate, to each achieve their own ends. Yeah. Right? And uh, he was his response was that um, if you have a social system that's bi- built around... Uh, fulfilling the desires of the individual, it's doomed to fail. You need a social system that's built around um, the good of the community or the the collective good. Because the government knows better what the needs of the people are. Well, it doesn't even matter like what you call that central authority. I mean, like it has its own problems, of course. Uh, but th- the issue is that there there's a lot of issues. Yeah. So let's start with. Um, subjective evaluation of value. Yeah. Right. That the the things that you think are valuable, I may not think are valuable. Yeah. Or I don't think that they're valuable in the same way. Or I value some things more than than you do. Um. So how do you how do you who determines the collective good? Yeah. And the the prime example I would give of something like that is that. Um, if we live on the coast, our little, we'll even start with a small community. We have a small community lives on the coast, um, and through democratic processes or whatever, we determine that the best thing that we can do with my labor is, uh, to catch fish. Okay. Mike, the fisherman. Or, or let's, let's actually use me as an example. (laughs) The best thing that we can do with my labor is have me catch crawfish. Oh, Mike's catching crawfish. All right. All right. Mike's the crawl daddy. So I'm allergic to crawfish. <laughs> so so we have made a poor decision. Yeah. So I don't want to spend all my time yeah. catching crawfish that I can't even consume. Yeah. This right. does me no good whatsoever. Yeah. Now, in a market, it does do me some good because I can catch crawfish and I can trade them for something that I want. Absolutely. And can eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But in a collective system, and obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying. I recognize that this isn't the only activity that would be engaged in. Yeah. But my point is that what about the people that are being forced into some activity through, through this idea of the collective good where it's nothing but a loss for them? Yeah. Well, and there's, there's always going to be jobs that people don't want to do. Right. And... They're not going to do those jobs to the best of their ability when they're forced to. Yeah. But in a market situation, people will choose to do those jobs because they will pay better. 
Yeah. Well, and but I think the key question there is where you anybody gets the authority to force somebody to do something they don't want to do. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, force force is the difference um, between uh, having friends over and kidnapping somebody. Force yeah. is the difference between sex and rape. Yeah. Right. Force is the difference in all of these things that between something good or something enjoyable or something voluntary and something bad and coercive. Like that's, yeah. you know, even evil. Yeah. Right. And so just the question of, okay, well, we need this done. Nobody wants to do it. We have to make somebody. Yeah. Is already a problem. Yeah. And the other part of it, of course, is that, um, that I think it was uh, James Madison, might have been Alexander Hamilton. Anyway, somewhere uh, in the Federalist Papers, there's a whole discussion about men are not angels. Yeah. Because if men were angels, you wouldn't need a government. <laughs> All right. Um, and then the and then it's it's also an excuse for why they have to constrain government. Yeah. Because. Just Governments because, are in by men. Yeah, just because somebody enters government doesn't make them suddenly an angel. Exactly. And and this is a this is a certainly a problem that that you cannot help but run into is that people are in their nature self interested. Yeah. And if you give them power over other people, they're going to use that power to their ends. Yeah. That the, these people around them just become means to their ends. And, and nobody should be treated that way. Like nobody wants to be a means to somebody else's ends. Yeah. And I, I would make the argument that it's immoral to use somebody as a means to an end. Yeah. Like it, purely. Absolutely. Um, now we all take advantage of each other in various ways, but the, the beauty of the market and subjective value means that like involuntary exchanges, both, both people walk away thinking that they got the better end. Yeah. Right. They both gave up something that they valued less than what they got or they wouldn't have made the exchange in the first place. Absolutely. Right. And that includes labor. No matter how much you want to argue about it, that includes labor. So you can you can bitch and moan about how terribly Amazon treats its employees. Yeah. But the reason that they're working for Amazon is because it's better than the alternative. Yeah. And they may not be happy at Amazon, but they chose to work at Amazon because it gives them something that they're willing to trade in that time for. Well, and it's interesting right now because um, even the on the news this week, they were talking about the labor reports and stuff. And we just this this country has a worker shortage right now um, where there's there are way more jobs out there than there are people to fill those jobs. Um, and it's affecting the economy. And, and I mean, it's affecting just going to a restaurant or something right now. Yeah. Like, I mean, I know us locally, I mean, we've went in tons of restaurants where like, yeah, this place is, let's not even go in here because they're clearly understaffed. Yeah. And I don't want any part of it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I went to a, um, a fast food place uh, earlier this week and, and I hate drive throughs I'm yeah. like, I'm not a fan of drive throughs Uh, so I parked my car and I walked up to the door and well, I, I was on my way walking up to the door yeah. and the girl stuck her head out of the drive through and said, yeah, you can't come in. <laughs> like only the drive through is open. We don't have people. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, ah, oh. that's the story all over the place, man. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, but it affects the economy, but that is a reaction from a part of that. At least is a lot of these jobs, people just aren't willing to do for the pay that's being offered. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting. Well, and the way to fix that is to offer more pay, but then prices are going to go up. Yeah. And then, Prices, and generally that's, speaking, that's all else the, being equal, demand for their product will go down. Yeah. Well, and on top of that, you're, we're in an inflationary period right now where like prices are already going up without that. Yeah. And so oh, I was so irritated. I don't think we talked about it on the podcast, but I watched the thing the other day where they were talking about inflation. And so they went down all of these lists of causings and contributors to inflation and why the prices keep going up and why there's no end in sight. Mm -hmm. And they never once mentioned all the money they've printed the past mm -hmm. like two years. It just doesn't come up. 
It's like it's it's Putin. It's the right. the distributors. Like they, yeah, these greedy capitalists. The capital, like it, they mm-hmm. went down the line. And I, honestly, like I watched it with an open mind. I was like, well, they're fixing to get to it. Like they're mm-hmm. gonna at least mention it. Mm-hmm. No, never even came up. Yeah. And these are supposed to be. This was on PBS. Supposed to, and it was supposed right. to be their big like um their oh, what do they call that guy? He's the the economics guy. Yeah. Uh. And I don't have a lot of respect for him. <laughs> Well, uh, the um, the issue to come back to is that the men aren't angels. Yeah. And one of the things uh, with my friend that keeps coming up because he's critical of the government. Yeah. And good. Uh, and yeah, and he should be. Yeah. And uh, and I, I made the argument to him um, that that these kind of hmm, I actually came across this fairly recently, I think. Uh, and and I'd always had a little bit of an issue with the uh, the power corrupts. Yeah. Uh, you know, adage or aphorism. Yeah. Um, and because there's something about it that just doesn't seem quite right to me. And I, I came across something where they're saying it's not that power corrupts, it's that power attracts corruptible people. Oh, there's something to that. And I thought that seems like a far more accurate way of, of describing it to me. Yeah. And it's certainly true in, in a democracy. The democracy is a way of getting the worst kind of people into, into power. It and seems it does, to me. And, and you're right in the fact that because there are politicians, I mean, there's very few, but you can find ones that aren't corrupted by mm-hmm. the, the power and the, the position that they've been given, mm-hmm. but they're so far in between. And that would add to the argument that, it's not that the power corrupts them. It's that the people who go for that power were corrupt to begin with. Yeah. Well, and he, he said to me, um, what if, uh, he said that you must have some politician that you like. And I was like, yeah, there are a couple. Yeah. Um, and he said, uh, what would happen if that person was uh, elected into a position where they could enact libertarian ideas? Would you be happy about that then? Because it's, you know, if they're all corrupt well, then wouldn't it seem i said would i be happy about it yeah because i would absolutely hope that they would use that position to um and it's not even so much to enact a libertarian principles say, that's the kind of the thing yeah it's we're to, going the opposite direction we're talking about dismantling mm-hmm. whole agencies yeah and whatnot <laughs> yeah exactly the i said the idea wouldn't even really be to use it to enforce libertarian principles it would just be taking power it would be rolling back yeah um, legislation that already exists. And there's plenty of them that would do it, man. My favorite is put Ron Paul over the Fed, man. Sure. <laughs> uh, who was the, um, who's the, uh, the anti-war, the, uh, the uh, former military guy that ran for the nomination for the Libertarian Party in 2020? Oh. You liked. Um, oh, um, ah, Adam Kokesh? Yeah, 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 exactly. Remember, his platform was, if I'm elected president, then the first day in office, I will renounce my title as president and take on the title of overseer of the dissolu- <laughs> The dismantling <laughs> of the federal government. Yeah, yeah or something yeah. like that. And, uh, and I love so- that principle, and I love that, <laughs> that just the idea of like running on that, because mm-hmm. what he wanted to do was, um, just like you said, like oversee the dismantling of the federal government and turning its assets over to the states. Mm -hmm. Like that was, that was his pitch. Like that's what we want to do. Like we're going to, we're starting from the top and we're going to dismantle it and turn it over to the states. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I mean, I thought that that, that's a message to get behind. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I I liked it too. I thought, (laughs) I thought that it was pretty funny. And, and I, I, but I said to my friend, I said, yeah, I would hope that they would use that opportunity to, to try and roll back some of the power, like to, yeah. you know, to uh, decentralize power. I said, but I would absolutely be afraid, every single one of them, yeah. that they would end up being what exactly what I didn't want. Well, and that's the reason for us libertarians, we want the true libertarian, like the, mm-hmm. the principled libertarian and not the Gary Johnson or the middle of the road libertarian, mm-hmm. because that libertarian won't, if they do ever get to that position, Will never actually make an impact. Yeah, it's like the Murray Rothbard versus the Milton Friedman. Yeah, right. Like the Murray Rothbard was absolutely for a complete freeing of the market. Yeah, like let it all go, no interventions, yeah. no stepping in. Let her up. Yeah, <laughs> let the let the capitalists do what the capitalists do. Let the labor do what the let the entrepreneurs do what they do. 
Yeah. Let everybody do their own thing. Cut it loose. And don't give any of these special privileges the government offers. Don't yeah. create barriers to entry to limit competition. Don't yeah. don't do any of this stuff. And Milton Friedman, while he talked a good game, yeah. was also on board with using the power of government to enforce a free market. Yeah, right. <laughs> which doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. Uh, but that's you know yeah that's the difference between the the middle of the road the kind of uh, yeah. milk toast libertarian like a Gary Johnson yeah. and uh, and somebody else like a Ron Paul or somebody who would who yeah. we would hope at least yeah. corruptible still absolutely but, um, you know that we would hope would use their authority to divest authority exactly. <laughs> And, and you just, I don't know, to me, you just can't count on the middle of the road guy because he's going to make too many compromises on the way. Mm -hmm. You need somebody that's coming in uncompromised, followed by principles, you know, mm -hmm. like this is what's right. This is what we're going to do. You Who would know. immediately be assassinated. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That guy don't stand a chance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, no, something else that I read not too long ago uh, that had an impact on on this discussion is that you have to organized society and this is not exactly how it was written um i'm 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 applying it to the situation here All right. but you have to plan society around uh, you can't plan society around people being at their best okay you have to plan society around limiting the impact of people at their worst yeah, but I just go back to the market does a better job than that than any government. Well, that's the ever point. It's because it's it's completely impersonal. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like the the market is just, you know, the, this is such a weird word because it it makes it sound like it's it, like it reifies this thing, and it, it's not it's not really a it's not it's not a real thing. The market is not a real thing. The market is is what we observe as people exchange things to get what they want. Yeah, that's really all it is. It's yeah. not even it's not even really a framework. Yeah, the free market. It's just it's just a series of people making individual decisions and cooperating with each other to each reach their own ends. Yeah, that's what that sounded more complicated than I thought that it would. <laughs> but but the point is but that it's, it's still... not it, it's not a it's not a structure. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't have it be a structure. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it, well, it, the free market is not a structure. It's yeah. just it's just observed behavior of people making exchanges. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, unlike socialism, which is absolutely a structure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That has to be followed. And something that you mentioned earlier that I, I think that always feels like that's the piece that's missing when I talk to him is the well, <laughs> you know, the whole idea actually of and this fits in with the idea of having a. Uh, a societal structure based around uh, the collective good um, beyond the who makes that decision and so forth is that it seems to me that it requires coercion. Yeah. That it, that you're not going to change the self-interested nature of people. And so in order to achieve this, even if you could like you would either, you'd have to get complete agreement. And that was part of the reason that I left Marxism. Yeah. Is that you needed a complete change in human nature and you needed a hundred percent buy-in. Yeah. And <laughs> you can't get a hundred percent of nothing. <laughs> and yeah, and neither of those things will ever happen. Yeah. Like it can be achieved on a small scale. Yeah. Like you a have commune or town. I'm thinking more like a family. Yeah. Well. <laughs> and even there, I bet you argue with your wife about where to put your resources sometimes. Occasionally. <laughs> yeah. So e even there you can't get a hundred percent agreement on on how things to need to be applied. Yeah. And of course, the uh, the big the large scale issue is the information problem. Yeah. Like that you could never put together a person or a group of people that would have all the knowledge necessary to predict down the road what everybody's going to need and wants and and know how to apply resources and labor to achieve that. Yeah. yeah. You just can't know. <laughs> but the, the market knows. Well, the market doesn't know either, but the market is reactive the market enough reacts, to uh, yeah. to um, to get there, more or less. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, within well, and it's not perfect within a margin of error. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and something that was pointed out in the article that I sent him that he was responding to, uh, and this was a um, another Sheldon Richmond article, is he says the 
you know, the big difference between the democratic process and the market process, such as it is, is that um, in democracy, the winner, it's winner take all. Yeah. The majority in the vote gets what they want and the minority gets nothing. Yeah. Generally speaking. Yeah. That, um, that 51% of the, of the voters get a hundred percent of what they want and 49% of the voters get 0% of what they want. Yeah. And at least in the market, um, the minority tastes are catered to. Yeah. You know, there's always a niche for, for selling to a smaller group of people. Yeah. But that aren't getting their needs fulfilled by some somewhere else in the market. Yeah. I, like yeah. everybody that's not getting their way in the market is an opportunity for an entrepreneur to fill in the gap. Yeah. And if you ever hung out with a bunch of people that are like entrepreneur minded, mm -hmm. you'll hear it come up constantly. Oh man, that's the opening in the market. Like that's a, that's a good idea. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I've hung out with a lot of those type people mm -hmm. and, and you always, that always comes up. It's like, oh man, that's an opportunity. That's yeah. an opportunity. You know, always looking for that thing that's not being provided mm -hmm. that, that could make money, mm -hmm. you know? And of course, in order to make money, they have to provide to somebody something that they want. Yeah. Yeah. You can't force them to buy it. They've got it. And, and, and that brings us back around to AOC. So why is she different now? Well, yeah. she's different now probably because she's been in that, she, she's gotten into the swamp herself. Yeah. And she went from being a bartender to now a congresswoman. Yeah. And people enter Congress as paupers and leave as princes over and over and over again. Oh, yeah. You can make a whole bunch of money just by being a congressperson. Now, that's not supposed to be the way it is, but you have inside knowledge of what's going on in the markets you, or, or what can affect the markets, I guess I should say. Yeah. Um, there's always uh, bribes and lobbyists and so on, all that stuff too. Yeah. So, and I don't think that th like this idea that, well, we just need to elect the right people. Will never work. Yeah. You'll never get there. That, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, you may get lucky and get a couple, but that that's never how it works. And what ends up happening in socialism is that you have two classes. Yeah. Much like you have now, because we're not far off of socialism in this country. I hate yeah. to break it to everybody. <laughs> we're right. more fascist than socialist at this point in time. But there's yeah. like there's not a it, it's really a difference in titles. Yeah. Those two things are pretty much the same. Yeah, they're pretty yeah. Uh but the you know, the socialism ends up with two classes. You have the political class and everybody else. Yeah. And the political class are the elites and everybody else is poor. And the, I've said over and over again on this podcast, to me, socialism is the idea that it's better to have everyone equally impoverished rather than unequally prosperous. Yeah. All right. So if that's what you want, if you're just upset about somebody having more than you, maybe socialism is the way to go. But you probably have more than you will have under socialism. Yeah, absolutely. Because they have the information problem. Nobody can centrally plan an economy. It just doesn't work. No. There's too much information to know, and nobody can know it. Yeah. Yeah. Ask and there's a whole bunch of prediction to be done. Yeah. You don't have... It's not even just like... Knowing what's going on right now, it's knowing what's needed in the future. Yeah. You know, what if you put everything into citrus and then there's a big, big freeze? <laughs> right. Well, now uh, you're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> I just asked the Soviets, man. They didn't have a good time with it. Mm -mm. Didn't work out well for them. <laughs> yeah. Ask the Ukrainians. <laughs> yeah, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I don't know. I don't know. I guess that wasn't bad for not having any plan. Yeah, like I say, we didn't really have a whole lot going in, so. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually, I plan to write an article uh, trying to respond to him. I just haven't had time to, <laughs> I haven't yeah. had time to do anything with it. I just, I just had ideas swirling in my head. But I think, I think, you know, particularly the, the question of um, why it's more important to, cater to individual desires or to plan around individual desires than the collective good. I just, I don't think that you get agreement on what the collective good is. Yeah. Who, who decides that? And the Democrat democratic process does not suddenly make something moral. 
No. Just because more people voted for it doesn't make it the right answer. Yeah, and you can find histories littered with examples of that. So. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. Um, right. And you can close it up. Yeah. No, I think we're good, man. I okay. don't have anything else. Well, uh, you know, it's the same same deal. Um, I'm busier, but I'm not buried yet. I don't know what next could, week will look but it like. It could happen at any time, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, yeah, I don't know what next week will look like, but we'll, you know, we'll, it, for this, for the time being, we'll plan um, to be here next week. Absolutely. Uh, just be prepared that it may not happen. Yeah. And because if, if I have thing. any less preparation than this, I like I don't want to do a podcast because <laughs> I don't want to sound like a yeah. like I don't know. I I hope that this one went okay. Um, it may have been a disaster. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Well, so comment and let us know if, we, if this is disastrous. Yeah. And um, and we'll try to avoid future disasters. There you go. And in the meantime, though, uh, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, and or YouTube. Uh, like and share. Um, leave comments. Tell your friends. Um, reviews etc all those things all that stuff helps and we appreciate every bit of it and we will plan to be back next week when we finally get this right and in the meantime try to stay free life short live free ciao later